Okay, good morning. So yesterday we were looking at the statement that the integral of one over the square root of one minus x squared dx equals the arc sine of x plus c. We'd made the observation that although this looks like a very unnatural integral, that square root will show up in situations where you have um, geometry, where you're working with right triangles, and one of the sides is either unknown or changing. And we put an example on the board. And I talked a little about the example, but I don't think I got to kind of the main crux of it, which is that these examples are done using U substitution, um, not the U substitution you're may be thinking of, not u equals one minus four x squared. But we can write four x squared as a square. Four is two squared, four x squared is two x squared. And we can then use U substitution to turn this into something that looks like the arc side. I mean, we're going to use U substitution and we're going to get one minus U squared and the integral will be the arc sine of u plus c. And once we've had that kind of brain blast, I mean, actually doing it is much like all of the substitutions we've done. We need a two. We don't have a two. We can put a two in, as long as we also put a one half in to balance things out. Then this one that was there, I mean, it's not really doing anything because it's one and that one half can pull in front of the integral. Again, we're only able to do this because they are constants. The 2dx will turn into du. We can write the du in the numerator or we can write the one in the numerator and then the du over on the right, whatever our heart desires. And then two X is U, so we have one minus U squared. And let's see, I'm running out of space, but I'm also running out of problem. This is now something that we know or, I mean, I don't know if we've memorized it yet since we only saw it yesterday, but this is the arc sign. So that's one half the arc sign of two X 
pass C. Um, this trick generalizes. You might think, okay, it's cute, but obviously that four was selected to work nicely. Four is two square. That's not really a real concern. I mean, I won't finish this problem out, but what if instead of four x squared, we had five x squared. Well, we can still write this. I mean, five isn't a perfect square, but that doesn't mean it's not a square, it's the square root of five squared. And we can then, let me close that square root. And we can then let u be the square root of 5x, du be the square root of 5dx, and proceed. And I said I wouldn't finish, but at this point, I mean, that would just be to save time. And at this point, we're virtually through. Um, we don't have a square root of five. We put one in. We also divide by it. I'm not going to worry about rationalizing or getting the square root in the top or anything. One over the square root of five does not outrage me. And this one over the square root of five will pull out. We'll get the integral. Now the square root and this dx will turn to du. the bottom, we have one minus u squared. So one over the square root of five, then that's the arc sign of the square root of five times x. So four being a perfect square was a convenience for our first problem. It's not a requirement. And it turns out that this method generalizes so we can deal with numbers other than one there, which is important. I mean, I said, the reason these integrals would show up is if you have triangles and I'm thinking on which should be which side, but if one of the sides was one and the other side was unknown, you would get this integral. And well, this is a very specific triangle though. I mean, what are the chances that a triangle you're looking at has exactly one as its side. Well, if we have another number, then instead of a one, we have, let me go back another frame. If we have another number, then instead of a one, we'll have something else there, some positive number. And fortunately, we can deal with such integrals, it's kind of a hassle. I mean, maybe that's not something that 
a teacher is supposed to say, but it is kind of a hassle. At the same time, the trick is not difficult. And um, each individual step is straightforward. It's just one of these things where you're doing a few or too many steps and the problem feels harder than it is as a result. Or, or maybe I'm just projecting my own feelings. So if we have a number instead of a one, we're going to pull that number out so that we have a one. When we pull a two out of a two, we get a one. When we pull a two out of a three, we get a three half. So we get a fraction. And now the square root of a product is the product of the square root. So we can break this up as the square root of two. Times the square root of one minus three halves x squared. And that square root is a constant and it's multiplication, it pulls right out. Just be a little careful, it's in the denominator, it's going to pull out as one over the square root of two. And at this point, we're back to the previous example, essentially. This one over the square root isn't hurting anything. Uh, the three over two is not a, I mean, it needs to be a square. Where again, we're trying to use this um, formula. So we need one minus u squared. Again, we almost have that. We have the x squared, but there's that number in front of the x squared. And again, the trick. is that every positive number can be written as a square. Every positive number is its square root squared. So we do that, and then we do u substitution. Let me move to a new frame. Square root of three over two x. Squared. And then we're just, we're doing what we've done before. It's, uh, sorry, the entire fraction is under the square root. We're doing what we did before. It's just, this square root of this fraction is, is kind of unappealing, but 
You know, we do the U substitution. Um, we need that square root of three over two to make dx. Well, we don't have it, but we can get it. If we put it in, we also need to divide by it, the old U substitution trick. Over the square root of one minus the square root of three over two x squared. All of that under a square root. And now we can proceed. This pulls out. We can do some work with this square root. It doesn't have to look as terrible as it does right now. But for the moment, let's just concentrate on the calculus and we can worry about simplifications later. Then the square root of three over two dx is going to turn to du. And we'll have the square root of one minus u squared. And maybe before I go to the next frame, because we're about done, but I'm also out of space, Let's deal with this. That's one over the square root of two. The square root of a fraction is the fraction of the square root. Then dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. The square roots of two cancel. And we're left with a nicer looking expression in front, one over the square root of three. So one over the square root of three times the arc sine of u. u is this, the arc sine of the square root of 3 over 2. x plus c. So I mean, from one point of view, having a number instead of a one there hardly changes anything. Having a number in front of a one gave us one extra step when we went from that first integral to the second integral. It's just kind of a hassle because when you pull that number out, you're going to get a fraction and then you're going to get the square root of a fraction. And unless you simplify early on, you're going to get things that look like this, which are kind of messy and hard to look at. So it's not fundamentally changing anything, but it is kind of unpleasant. And there is an alternative, which is to just memorize a formula. So depending on where you stand, vis-a-vis -vis memorizing formulas versus sort of messy algebra. Is, 
you can see where I stand vis-a-vis -vis memorizing form de Beauce because I haven't, but copying out of my notes, one over the square root of a squared minus u squared du is the arc sine of u over a plus c. So this is giving us, where was that example? I'm not sure it was in our notes. This is giving us a way of a, to approach an integral like this. without doing the algebra and without factoring out the two, using the plug and play formula as follows. Every positive number is a square. So we once again make this argument that two is the square root of two squared minus, or once again, going to have to write this as a perfect square. So we're still going to get square roots floating around. Nothing anyone can do about that. I mean, it's in the... Uh, in the problem, actually suffering uh, here. This form of the can't quite be right, but let's go through and let's see. So we then let u be the square root of three x. Oh, yes it can, it can be right. Du is the square root of three du. We still have to do that substitution. Dx, sorry, am I, uh, I was rattled. So we let u be that, we let du be that. We're going to now have a squared and u squared after we do this substitution. Um, we're missing a square root of three. So as we've done so often in the past, we just put the thing we want in, but we also divide by it. Inside the square root, we've got a number squared. So we've got the square root of two squared, and we've got u squared. And this is messy notation. I should have u's and x's in the same integral, but my very next step is going to be to rewrite this without the dx. I'm also going to pull that one over the square root of three out. And now, 
that's give us space to work. We have one over the square root of three. We have something squared. So our A is the square root of two. On the top, we ought to have u. u is the square root of three times x plus c. And this is the same formula that we got using our sort of messy algebra. I, I, here it is. Um, it's written slightly differently, but again, the square root of a fraction is the fraction of the square roots. So the square root of three over two is the square root of three divided by the square root of two. Um, the reason I was kind of hesitant at first was that, I mean, I knew, knew we should get the number in front of the arc sign. And for a moment, I wasn't seeing where it would come from because there's no number in front of the arc sign in this formula, but it came from here. It came from the U substitution that we had to do to make this look like the square root of A squared minus U squared. So that's one of the three inverse trig functions we'll look at. We, um, we'll spend less time on the others because all of this, it's all of the work is done basically the same. Um, I mentioned this. You yeah. might expect that the next thing we're going to look at is the arc cosine, sine cosine tangent, kind of the what we might think of as the three main trig functions. So that's not actually useful because the arc cosine of x is very, very similar to the arc sine of x. In fact, it's pi over 2 minus the arc sine. And what that means is that the derivative of the arc cosine is basically the derivative of the arc sine. The pi is a constant, it goes away. The only difference is that we get the negative sign, negative one over the square root of one minus x squared. Well, we've said before, the reason we're covering this now and not back when we cover the other derivatives is we really don't care about the derivatives so much. We care about the integration that we can do using these as a tool. So every differentiation gives you an integral
So you might say, all right, well, now that we know the derivative of the arc cosine, we get a new antiderivative. Is that not useful? And the answer is no, it's not useful because we could already take this integral. We could already take this integral <coughs> because you can think of a negative sign as a negative one. It's a constant that you can pull out of integrals, and now this is an integral we know. It's the arc sine of x plus c. So any, any integral you could take using the arc cosine, you can take using the arc sine. It's not giving us anything useful in that respect. Instead, we'll go to the arc tangent. And the derivative of the arc tangent even though you might think of the tangent as being more complicated than the sine, it's the sine divided by the cosine, but the arc tangent has a simpler um, derivative. There's no square root, it's just one over one plus x squared. And the derivative of the arc tangent shows up all the time. I mean, it's difficult to just give an application without any background, but in like an hour's time, I'm going to be teaching differential equations and we're going to be looking at motion with air resistance. And one of the things we're going to do to, have to study motion with air resistance is use this derivative or rather than the derivative, we're going to use the integral we get. From the derivative. So it really does show up in real world situations. And again, I mean, you can see it geometrically. If you're messing around with triangles and one of the legs is one and the other leg is unknown. And this is the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse square is one squared plus x squared. So this one plus x squared tends to show up in geometric problems. It's why it shows up in motion with air resistance. It's a geometric problem. Something is boring. And I said we're not going to spend as much time on this as we spent on the arc sign. And that's just because the tricks are all basically the same. I mean, what if, what if instead of one plus x squared,
we had one over one plus three in x squared. Well, we'd see this. We'd think about it a bit. I mean, we know that this is going to be an arc tangent just because of when I'm doing the example. But again, in the real world, it's not always obvious. This is an arc tangent. This is not. If we had an X up there, we would use U substitution and we get a natural log. If we had an X squared up there, it wouldn't be a U substitution or a natural log and we would not be able to solve the problem. So these are really delicate in the sense that minor alterations totally change the shape of the problem. But here we have one over one plus something squared, or rather one plus a constant times x squared. So the square root of 3x squared. And this gives us, well, no, I was trying to save space, but it does not give us that. Trying to save space is a remnant from when I was still on a blackboard and absolutely pointless. Let's write this all out. One over one plus the square root of three X squared. U is the square root of three times X. DU is the square root of three. Now I'm going to read the square root of three, but of course we can't just shove it in there. We also divide by the square root of three to cancel stuff out. That one over the square root of three. Pulls out of the integral. The square root of three dx is going to turn to du. Um, the, that will leave us a one up here. Then the bottom will be one plus u squared. And this is the arc tangent of u and u is well, I forget, but I can look it up. U is the square root of three times X. Plus a constant of integration. So the tricks are all the same. If you had a number instead of a one here, and this time, I know I always say I won't finish problems out and then I finish them out, but this time I really won't. But if we had like a seven here, same trick as before, we 
me pull that number out. And then we proceed with the U substitution. Um, just as with the arc sign, there is an alternative here involving A's and U's. I have never actually memorized that formula, and it doesn't seem to be in my notes, so I'm going to have to direct you either to the textbook or to my canvas notes where it is. Let me see. In both, I haven't mentioned this, but maybe I should. Maybe this is a situation where I'm just so used to this that I mean, if we have, uh, we've seen how we can deal with it if we have a number other than one there. And it's no problem if instead of an x squared, we have a constant times an x squared. Well, what if in all of these formed of those, I've had a one up on top? What if we don't have a one? What if we have something else? Um, this is not a real issue. This is using the fact that we can take constants and pull them out of integrals. This is nine times the integral of one plus this, seven plus that. So having a different number up front is no problem. But again, and I know I'm repeating myself, but it's important, this integration always is a very delicate process. Having just a nine up top didn't change anything. If we had a nine times an X, or a nine times a square root of X, or a nine times X squared, or the natural log of X, all of those would totally change the problem. Some of them we'd be able to do, others we wouldn't, but none of them would involve this arc tangent. There's one more form to the, and I never, I feel like it always gets maybe short shrift, but that's because by the time we get to it, I'm running out of steam, and it's also the only one of these three form to those that I've never seen in application, and it's a little hard to know what an application would look line, but and this formula is traditionally written in a more complicated way, but I'm just going to put it here. times the square root of x squared minus one. I don't like the way I wrote that. I think it makes it look like I'm taking the x root, which I am not doing, x times the square root of x squared minus one. So this has some similarities to the arc sign, 
Um, the subtraction is reversed here. The x is on the left, but more than the subtraction being reversed, we have a variable showing up in two places. There's an x inside the square root, and there's an x outside of the square root. And this comes from the arc secant. And we get an unexpected absolute value sign. And again, although I've never personally seen examples of this, I have to trust that the textbook is not offering stuff at random. And if it's asking students to look at this formula, it's because the formula, you know, I've never taken an engineering class. The fact that I've never personally seen an example doesn't really mean much. And then this one time it is in my notes. If instead of a one, you have something else, like you have a five, you can try to deal with that. Or you can just use this expanded formula. Um, this formula kind of bizarrely, I mean, you think all calculus textbooks are basically doing the same thing. Sometimes you see it written slightly differently. Like sometimes you'll have absolute values over here on the left instead of on the right and so on. But sometimes you won't see absolute values at all. Sometimes people will get a little messy maybe, and they'll say, I'm just going to assume that everything's positive and not worry about this. Um, but this is the integral we get from the derivative of the arc secant. And I predicted we'd run long, but we won't, um, unless anybody has any questions. Then I will see you Monday.